first well today's agenda there is a I Cindy, I think you're you're breaking up, Cindy, a lot. Yeah, same here, Enrique. It's bad. Um, today's agenda. Cindy, can you hear us? Cindy, can you hear me? Hi, Cindy. You are breaking up a lot. I'm so sorry about that. Is it better? Much better, Cindy. I can hear clearly like if you, you were at the office, clearly. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Um, I was actually saying, well, I'm assuming you didn't hear anything that I said. <laughs> so again, welcome to day three of our prep training. My name is Cindy Jones. I'm the communications officer at the National AIDS Commission. Um, I am sharing my screen. And I'm quickly going to go over today's agenda. I was saying that we have um, an addition to today's agenda, a welcomed addition. Uh, we have Mr. Joel Simpson from SASOD. And SASOD is the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination. This morning, Mr. Simpson will be speaking to us briefly about um, the country experience, Guyana's experience with PrEP. So very much looking forward to hearing from him immediately after um, we, we begin. Then we're going to go into- Cindy, your volume is fading out. I don't know if it's me or everybody, but the, the, your volume is fading. Volume is fine for me. What's happening? <laughs> the volume is fine for me. Cindy's volume oh, is fine okay. for me. Okay, perfect. I'm so sorry. Um, technical difficulties, I guess these things happen. But yeah, so then after we hear from Mr. Simpson, we're going to go in to a presentation from Dr. Monica Alonso, as you can see here on my screen, and then another presentation from Dr. Bernardo. We're going to hear from nurse Veronica Ortega from the Ministry of Health and Wellness here in Belize. And then we're going to have a presentation by Mr. Enrique Romero before we close off our third and final day again welcome thank you all so much for being with us and um miss sandra if we don't have an assessment this morning i'm going to ask mr joel to go ahead do we yes um he can go ahead and we will um uh, do the assessment at the end thank you okay perfect perfect mr simpson the floor is yours Oh, where's muted. <laughs> Morning, everyone. I'm, thank you for the kind introduction, Cindy. I'm Joel Simpson, um, the Managing Director of Sasa Diana. And the Sasa Diana is a uh, over 18 year old human rights organization and movement that's leading change, educating and serving communities to end discrimination based on sexuality and gender in Guyana and the Caribbean. As part of our work as a civil society organization, under one of three programs which we implement, we have three programs, a human rights program, a homophobia education program, and a human services program. As part of our human services program, we do a lot of work on public health to ensure that everyone has um, access uh, to services to achieve the highest attainable standard of health including mental health, which is one of our human rights. And uh, a huge part of that has been working on HIV since 2005, some about some two years after we started, and working on HIV with a particular focus on vulnerable populations who have for a long time been left behind. When it comes to PrEP, um, I'm just going to share a little bit about our advocacy and journey to get to a place where we have PrEP in Guyana. And then I'm going to share a little bit about um, my own thoughts on the role civil society can play in the implementation of PrEP programs, um, particularly in the Belize context. For SASOG as an organization, PrEP 
came on our radar around 2016, um, organizationally, and we wanted to have this very effective medicine in Guyana and available to those who need it. Because we were seeing around the world, in the major metropolitan cities that PrEP was a game changer in HIV prevention, is a game changer in HIV prevention. Um, new infections were uh, dropping, rates of new infections were dropping drastically, significantly in major metropolitan cities across the world, like London, New York, um, Toronto, and so on. And um, the data was showing that PrEP was very effective medicine. And we need it in our tool of arsenals for HIV prevention. Between 2016 and 2018, we engaged a number of partners um, to basically start to research the issue. And fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of those um, engagements didn't pan out into anything um, um, for various reasons. But we included reaching out to Gilead. We had some engagements with um, Pam, um, with PAHO, with, with um, CARFA, uh, the National Institutes of Health. We were, was also engaged about possibly doing a study. Um, and they wanted a focus within the PrEP study on NCDs that didn't pan out. So we got to a stage in 2018 where we applied for a small grant from the, um, an organization in the UK called Frontline AIDS, which provides, um, has a rapid response fund for particular countries around the world. And they have a focus on key population, key, key population issues. And with that small grant, we were able to do a qualitative assessment among MSM, and trans people in Guyana, looking at their knowledge, um, attitudes, the exact title of the study, the knowledge, attitudes, and delivery preferences for PrEP among MSM and trans persons in Guyana. So I think this is the first kind of seminal thing that we did um, after you know two years of engaging. Um, that didn't result in anything. In terms of, in terms of this study, um, like I said, it was qualitative. Um, so we had focus groups in five of the 10 administrative regions of our country. And we had 17 trans women and 30 MSM, just to give you a size, a sense of the scope and size of the study, uh, who participated in those focus groups. Now you might be wondering, uh, for those of you who are a little into research, might be wondering why qualitative. Uh, we had constraints. Um, well, quantitative, a survey might have been ideal. It's far more expensive and far more time, time consuming. And like I just shared, we had been engaging for two years with various international partners and um, those engagements weren't panning out. So we decided to undertake what we could do with the minimal resources we could acquire on our own and for us, our qualitative study made sense. I'm saying that to say that for Belize, that is now at the stage where it's about to launch um, its own PrEP program. I think it would be important um, for the government of Belize um, to undertake a baseline, particularly among, um, what's the WHO language? Um, persons who are at high risk for HIV, um, to see what they know about PrEP, their attitudes towards it, and how they would like to receive PrEP for those who are interested. And I think that will really inform how the PrEP program is implemented. And I think it's really important to hear from the potential clients and not make assumptions. So um, if, if if it's possible, I would really advocate for um, some research to be done now and to be done relatively quickly on this. Um, that research will serve two purposes for Belize. Um, one, you have some baseline data uh, on PrEP specifically for, for key populations. Um, 
two, you will have information that will feed into program design. Let me just share the four key recommendations that came out of the 2018 study. And if anyone is interested in actually seeing the report, it's, it's not a very long report. I, if I recall correctly, it's about five pages. Um, easy to read, um, deliberately easy to read and accessible. I could always share it with, um, with Shanti and you guys could receive it after the webinar. But let me share the key recommendations. The first recommendation we made is that sensitization and, and education and prep is needed in the country, in our country context, especially outside of the region which, which houses the capital city. Um, the urban centers of any country, people tend to have more access to more information and tend to be more knowledgeable. So you really need to fan out that sensitization and education to um, you know, um, regions and districts and provinces outside of the capital. The second recommendation, well, we, we called for um, implementation of free prep as part of um, the government's HIV services. And the government had made, and all our governments, in fact, had made commitments since the 2015 call to action of the second Latin American and Caribbean forum on the continuation of HIV care. And in that declaration, in that call to action, um, call to action um, all our governments of Latin America and Caribbean committed to um, starting free prep as part of the HIV services. So we just kind of reiterated that. Um, what we proposed if starting out, um, the government did not want to um, do prep for all persons at high risk is the less desirable, but possibly a more feasible option which was to offer PrEP to persons in relationships um, with, with a person who's HIV positive. The public health term is um, persons in relationship um, or zero discordant status. And at the time the research was done in 2018, this was being done in St. Lucia, Suriname and Grenada at least. And that is actually how the PrEP started in Guyana, the, act, the government actually took up that recommendation. And that is how PrEP started in Guyana in 20, 2019, 20, 2019, right? Just um, a year after we would have um, released, or, or months after we would have released these findings in August of 2018. Um, in terms of, the role civil society can play. Um, oh my, okay, thank you. Sure, Caleb, we'll share the we'll share the um we'll share the assessment. In terms of the role civil society can play, and Cindy, just um um let me know how I'm doing for time. I don't want to uh, run into anybody else's thoughts because I didn't have the opportunity. No problem. No problem. Right. You could go time ahead. Time my intervention. In terms of the role that um civil society can play, I think. When it comes to prep delivery, persons should have as many options as feasible. Um, some persons will easily go to your, your, your HIV care, HIV testing and treatment sites that the government has. And but we know that a lot of people will know will not go to those sites because of the stigma related to HIV. I know people in Guyana who will not even go and get a free HIV test at public treatment sites because they don't want anybody to see them even going near there. They rather go to a private institution and pay for a test. So I think people should have all of those um, delivery, prep, uh, delivery options. Um, PrEP should be available in the public healthcare system where I think the brunt of it might be accessed um, in terms of numbers and volume. Definitely for those um, what I would might say, middle to upper class, white collar persons who don't even even generally access public health care systems. Um, having a public private partnership where persons can get the free prep at private hospitals and private clinics, um, but they pay those institutions for the services that they take there, consultation fees with the doctors, and even if they use their labs and so on there, um, they would have to pay directly, but they would still get 
the drugs, the medicine um, for free through a partnership, through a public-private partnership with the government, which is how the government of Guyana first started its PrEP program um, when they were doing it for just zero discarding couples. The arms and then the, the angle for civil society, and this is what happened very effectively in Barbados, is where you have strong, capable civil society organizations who are doing clinical HIV services, like testing and treatment and so on. Um, those organizations can be supported. And especially if they're already working with key populations, those organizations can be supported to, um, to add PrEP services to the menu of clinical HIV services that they have that they have to offer. Um, we recognize that PrEP is medication that needs to be administered by a doctor. So, and you have to have um, certain facilities to do some tests or relatively close access. Um, to certain kinds of facilities. Um, the clinical people on the call would know um, sometimes clients need to do uh, liver function tests, kidney function tests, and so on. Um, I believe in some, in places like Barbados, there's a partnership with the government, with the government program itself. So while the civil society organization equal, equal, equals in Barbados, um, had a day, a specific day and a clinic time where persons could come in and see a LGBTIQ uh, friendly doctor, somebody who was known to the community and part of the community um, and see a doctor um, there. I believe there was a partnership that existed in some way to facilitate all the lab services um, being done for those clients outside of the CSO. So those metrics would, and those logistics would depend on location and, and the days and the times that um, the CSO or CSOs might possibly um, run, run their, their services. Uh, what I would advise or recommend, which seems to work well in the Ghana context, is that particularly if CSOs are doing offering prep, is that they try to complement the government and, and the private sector services in some way. Um, so for instance, um, the, the, the public health care system, the labs and clinics might open nine to five or whatever, Monday to Friday. CSOs can offer an option of evening clinics, Saturday clinics and that sort of thing. So it's at a time when the, the public sites are not open. So those who can't make it during the day, um, because of work, other commitments, don't want to ask the employer to, to time off to go deal with HIV services, whatever it is, they have another option. Um, and I think that's what equals in Barbados did. They actually had an evening, um, one evening clinic and one, one Saturday option. Of course, the private healthcare places will operate, um, with, will operate within the confines of their own business hours. Another important role for civil society to play is the first recommendation that came out of our assessment. I think civil society needs to be uh, supported to conduct sensitization and education with key populations. Um, and government needs to support civil society to do this because they have that reach. Um, sometimes we get, um, sometimes I think we miss the mark when government tries to do some of these things themselves and think that um, education targeting key populations um, is sufficiently done from um, government media, um, government social media and so on, where they don't really have the reach um, with the target group. So I'm stressing here that government, government to Belize needs to support the civil society organizations in Belize to do the sensitization and education themselves because they have the reach and the trust of the, the communities that they're part of and serve. Um, when I say sensitization and education, um, social media is a cost-effective forum, but I don't want to limit those interventions to just social media. Um, the groups on the ground will know best how to, how to do that work in a COVID-19 world. Um, but to my mind, it can include 
um, brochures and um, it can be included as part of the outreach work that groups um, normally do when they're providing um, condoms and, and lube and testing services um, at hot spots, so to speak, to, um, to key populations. Um, so I think it's one of the one of the services that can also be added there. And I think as far as possible in the context of COVID-19, um, some of that sensitization and education needs to happen in person, face-to-face, -face, um, especially for persons whose um, literacy level might not allow them to consume as much from maybe traditional or social media. Um, so the, the other role that I think community civil society needs to play in prep programming is um, community monitoring, community monitoring of the services. Um, and as part of the program design, the Belize Ministry of Health should ensure that there's a component of community monitoring where people can get feedback um, from, from, from the clients. I know that a lot of public health care institutions have their own mechanisms. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a box of clinics where people could write a complaint and so on. But those mechanisms are often underutilized for obvious reasons. But persons will tell, especially if they've heard about the service from a civil society organization, they will come back and say um, what went well and what didn't go well. And Working closely with KP NGOs, the ministry should be building a, a component of community monitoring to get that kind of feedback. Um, in our context, we we get we get feedback all the time when we refer clients, um, and both good and bad. We hear sometimes uh, people get turned away at a particular public site because the person the personnel at a particular place um, might be thinking that they came for prep for PEP, um, post-exposure prophylaxis, and not PrEP, um, despite them saying clearly to, um, that they're here for PrEP. And we've had situations where new personnel at clinics and so on didn't even know what services were being um, offered, including PrEP, and um, people were turned away and had to be redirected again and so on. So the community monitoring component is very important because you might have your, you might have your program might have this service, but then you're not seeing the uptake um, that you expect. And you're going to be wondering why, why are people coming? <laughs> you know, the community is asked for prep, why are they taking it up? And it could be various reasons. And if you don't have um, a, a component where community monitoring is built in, so you get that trusted, confidential uh, feedback that people will give to, to the community organizations that they're affiliated with, you might be missing the mark on how you can um, adjust programming, um, fix bottlenecks, deal with service quality issues in the um, implementation of your prep program. I'm pretty sure I've way exceeded my, my 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to stop there and try to read Caleb's many questions in the chat <laughs> and see if there are any other comments or questions um, to which I should respond. What's the other thing? Okay, it's not baseline, but it's a pilot testing prep. Okay. Um, could you explain that? What do you mean it's a pilot testing? Yeah, Caleb, you want Caleb, you want to um vocalize your intervention because I'm not following clearly. Yes, yes. I was just going to say for those who have an intervention, it may be best for you to release your mic and so that um, the, the, it could be understood clearly and we could and Mr. Simpson will be able to address accordingly. Thanks. Caleb, go ahead. Um, Joelle, who, in terms of your baseline, was that a focus group evaluation? Was, was that a sample size of 20 or 30 people? And um, 
what did you look for in terms of the in people you interviewed to find out their perception of prep? Okay, any other related questions before I respond to Caleb? Not this time, but well, I'll take that one. Um, Caleb, we didn't do a baseline in Ghana. Um, I'm recommending that one is done. I think that's that's the best approach to have. So I was saying clearly that we didn't do uh, a mixed methods um, kind of study. I think quantitative would be important um, if the resources are available to do it because it's time consuming, it's more expensive. Um, we had to undertake our assessment. We did a qualitative assessment. We had to undertake that on our own. Um, and, and find money to do it on our own. So we didn't have the kind of resources that we would ideally want to do uh, a survey, which is what um, CARFA had recommended between 2016 and 2018 when we were using them. Um, you asked some questions, so I shared a little bit about, um, I shared a little bit about the method, but Caleb, I'm gonna share the full report and, um, I could also share the focus group discussion guide um, if you think that would be helpful. Um, but I shared a little bit that we we did six focus group of six focus groups of five to ten persons. So in total, we engaged four to seven par participants um, in five of of the ten administrative regions in our country. Um, in our context, of that would be regions four to six and ten. So we were very much focused on the urban coastal regions for obvious reasons, cost factors, that's where we could find KPs and you know, um, the cost to get to the rural and interior regions and a smaller number of KPs um, didn't make it feasible to do focus groups in those regions. Um, Belize might have a different kind of um, geography that might allow for, for a different kind of a approach or, or in terms of coverage of regions and things like that. Um, and the mix between, um, or the breakdown, the gender breakdown was 17 trans women and 30 MSM. So that's how the 47 was made up. So I think that was a good mix. Um, and the average age of um, a person attending the focus group was, um, 29 and a half years, yeah. Um, but yeah, Caleb, I could share, in addition to the assessment, the actual focus group discussion um, guide that we used to see if, just in case it's something that you guys could find useful in Belize to, you know, uh, replicate or adapt in your own way. So Joel, I asked because we supposedly have a plan, but um, that plan has not been shared uh, or um, I'm not clear as to how that plan has developed. So I asked within the context of, of the audience, so that's important going forward. I also asked within the context as the oversight chair for the national response, um, we have a habit here of just take boxing our activity and never eva not truly evaluating the effectiveness of our um, activities. So I'm, I'm looking for ways to strengthen that process. So that's my context of speaking to you. Okay, okay, okay. So is there, so I understand if, do I understand correctly that there's a, a plan in Belize, like a, like a prep, prep implementation plan? Perhaps someone from the Ministry of Health. Hi, Joel, Enrique here from the NSC. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing some of the experiences with, with us. Um, before I answer the question, just to quickly say that um, as part of our next steps in this uh, plan is for us to uh, through the, obviously with the support from PANCAP and the PAHO to engage civil society in the region, you know, Guyana, Barbados, Bahamas, uh, for a session with civil society from Belize so that we can learn from the experiences in some of these um, countries in, in our region as to the, the experiences with PrEP, no? 
there is a plan. I have a presentation later on where I will outline some of the, the things that we have done so far. Um, so that's that's in 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 a presentation that I will be doing shortly. No, but thanks, um, Joel. And like I said, we'll be reaching out to you guys and other colleagues in the region for us to have a session whereby we can go more into detail as to answer some of the questions that that Caleb was asking in terms of the focus groups and and some of the things and experiences that um, these CSOs have. Uh, in the in the region no, that can help our CSOs and our um, national response as well in Belize. No? So over to you, thanks. All right, do we have any additional questions for Mr. Simpson? Anyone? If there are no additional questions, Mr. Simpson, thank you so very much for providing us with this presentation. I feel like it was very informative and the fact that you accepted on such short notice, we greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a productive Moving along. Thank you. Um, Cindy, can I just one second? Cindy, can sure. I just one second? Yes, sure. I just want to thank Mr. Simpson on behalf of PAHO for actually um, um, taking up the um, challenge at such late uh, notice. And just to inform everyone that yes, there was supposed to be as part of the agenda, a full um, presentation on civil society's participation with PrEP, but unfortunately there was an emergency with the person and so it could not happen. But um, this is something that we will continue to ensure that there is a follow-up session uh, organized with civil society and those that are interested for other organizations, including Barbados, to share their uh, experience on a much larger scale. Thanks. Thank you both very much. Moving right along, um, we are going to have a presentation on monitoring HIV prevention services in the context of PrEP, as well as revision of tool to generate indicators for monitoring PrEP and key reports. What presentations will be done by Dr. Bernarda Nuce. Dr. Nuce, thank you so much, and you could go right ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen first, and please let me know when you can see it. We can see it. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present here. My name is Bernardo Nuce. I am an HIV technical officer at the Pajo Regional Office, and I work together with uh, Dr. Monica Alonso that also, uh, and we support all the aspects related to strategic information for HIV and STI in the region. So our presentation uh, seems to, or wants to include some or introduce some aspects of monitoring HIV prevention in the context of pre-exposure prophylaxis, that is the, the stage in which Belize is right now. I'm gonna be covering the main aspects of monitoring HIV and STI prevention services among key populations. I will give you some of the considerations that are necessary to build the HIV prevention cascade. That is one of the new, uh, relatively new additions for the monitoring of, pre of HIV services that we firstly introduced like three years ago uh, after publishing our monitoring framework for HIV prevention services among key populations. And then I will give you a brief overview of the spreadsheet that we have to calculate the HIV cascades and other relevant indicators for HIV prevention, including some indicators for PrEP. So uh, the first thing here, and is, this is just to complement what was probably said in the previous days of the, this capacity building, we are talking about HIV prevention services and HIV prevention services need to be implemented in a context of combination HIV prevention approach in which we are combining the biomedical interventions such as PrEP and other interventions such as behavioral intervention and structural interventions. So it's only with a combination of these three factors that we can actually succeed in advancing towards the goal of uh, reducing or eliminating HIV as a public health problem and reducing dramatically the, name, the number of new HIV infections. 
why we consider it's important to monitor in HIV prevention services. First, because this will allow us to measure the coverage and quality on HIV STI services for key populations. Then because it will allow us to improve the data quality of the information that we are measuring. And as a final instance, and this is probably the most important thing is because we can use and we must use this information to generate changes in service probation and the operating procedures. So basically we need to improve those parts in which we are identifying gaps and we need to expand those areas in which we are actually obtaining success. So this is what we finally intend to do with the information that we generate when we monitor HIV prevention services. Here, I have a full uh, relationship of what are the HIV prevention services. Uh, this is, a, I mean, a general slide in which basically what I want to show here is, of course, that services are based, all, all the services that are offered for HIV prevention services, and this is what the purple arrow is showing, needs to be based on human rights, inclusive and free and strict man discrimination, uh, so to create a friendly environment or a facilitating environment for people to access these services. But when we are talking about HIV prevention, we are uh, talking about a continuous of prevention. So we are talking about how people need to be um, taken to the HIV prevention services. So they need to access the HIV prevention services. They need to be linked to these services and they need to be follow up on these services to ensure that in the long term they are sustained HIV free. So within all this process, there, are, uh, uh, there is a long number, a long list of HIV prevention services or HIV related prevention services that are to be offered to the populations. Uh, here we have a, a list that, and all these services that we have here are services that are great recommendations from WHO. So there is an evidence that these services should be offered to the populations uh, that are uh, at a different risk of HIV. Uh, so different, uh, generally what we include here is of course, HIV testing, oh, yes, stop. provision of condoms and lubricants, and also the services related to STI testing and treatment in the case that people have positive treatment, uh, positive results of, of a screening for STIs. And now in the context of PrEP, we will be talking about the risk assessment, assessment and PrEP eligibility that is, has been covered in the previous days of this capacity building and the offer of PrEP. So this is basically a comprehensive package of services that is offered along the continuum of care and that needs to be adapted to the different needs of the population. So some people may be a higher risk of HIV, so they need probably a more continuous follow-up and they need a different a package of services or a more tailored package of services and other people that may be a lower risk. And we need to be very, very sure that we are, uh, of course, offering these services to the population and that they have access to these prevention services. So this is a long list of services. So how can we monitor this? And to monitor this, we proposed uh, the HIV prevention cascade. So just to start with, I'm just gonna give a brief overview, a reminder, uh, because of course, all of you know this, is about the HIV care cascade. So what we intend to monitor with the HIV care cascade is that everyone who is uh, living with HIV uh, uh, is able to know their HIV status. So we follow up how many people know their HIV status, how many people are linked to HIV care, how many people are, um, are on uh, IRT, and how many people achieve the suppressed viral load. That is the final outcome we expect to find with the, with the, with the HIV care uh, continuum. So this is how we monitor the HIV care continuum. And this is a cascade that many countries in the regions have been already, and it's part of the, of the monitoring requirements in any HIV program. What we introduce here to monitor the prevention of HIV services comes from an idea of changing a little bit the, paradig the paradigm of services who are, that, are, that are offered to population or to HIV, negative, to HIV negative population. So the basic idea, the underlying idea is that we don't want people who come to a service and have an HIV test to be lost to follow up. So we don't want to say a person, okay, your HIV test is negative, so come after a year and we will perform another HIV test because that person might be a high risk of HIV. So what we want is to ensure that that person receives a number of services across time so that person can uh, be sustained HIV free. So the way that we monitor this, and I'm gonna go uh, 
through each of the pillars of this cascade is through this HIV prevention cascade that, as, as I said, was first proposed in the monitoring framework for HIV prevention services that was published by PAHO back in 2019. So we have a first pillar in which we are going to have an estimation of our key population, and this is disaggregated by each key population, and I will give a little bit more of insights of how to disaggregate data by key population, although I know the country already has some mechanisms to do that. Um, so what we are going to have first is the estimation of our key population that is HIV negative. One way to calculate this may be, for example, to use the data of population size estimates. I know Belize has a has a, 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 a population size estimate study. I don't remember which, which, which year was it done, but do have that data available. And then we could subtract from that number the total of people who are living of HIV from the spectrum estimate. So we would have like a number, an estimation of how many people of a certain population are HIV negative. Then we go to the programmatic pillars. The first one is gonna be that those people who are, um, who belong to our key population are going to receive an HIV test. Some of them are going to have a positive result. So these are going to be HIV positive people who were not aware of their status and that they need to be put immediately in care. But other people are going to have this HIV ne uh, negative test result. And what we want is to ensure that those people are linked to HIV prevention services. What we mean by linking to HIV prevention services is offering a minimal, minimal package of services that allows that this person is actually receiving um, some uh, of the services that it needs to, 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 be, uh, to actually keep uh, uh, or maintain their sexual health or to ensure that this person is actually linked in a, in a kind of a more strict way to a service. So what we've seen in some countries in the past is that Maybe um, a person that received an HIV negative test receive a package of condom and an informative talk, and that's all that happened until the next visit. So what we promote is a more strict linkage to services. And our criteria for establishing linkage is um, to, um, I mean, we can use either of these criteria. It's first that the person has a medical record open in the service or that the person receives a, a screening test for an STI, for example, syphilis, or that this person receives an HIV a risk assessment or profitability, that is what should be done when you are actually uh, checking the eligibility for PrEP, or that the person is offered PrEP. So this is what we consider that a person is linked to HIV prevention services. After the person is linked, we want the person to be followed up. So what we consider a follow-up in an HIV prevention services is that that person comes back to the service after 12 months or within the next 12 months to have another HIV test. And depending on these results of this person, I mean, what we, what we aspire to have is that that person is HIV negative due to the fact that it has been receiving or it has been linked consistently to HIV prevention services. So this is the general idea of the HIV prevention cascade. Um, and of course, feel free to make any questions if you want. Um, so when we are, um, talking about the context of PrEP implementation, we uh, add some disaggregation to this HIV prevention cascade. And this is what happened here. Um, so the first two pillars remain the same. We have our estimation of HIV negative people, and we have our uh, people who are tested on the services, and we have our HIV negative people here. Because we are implementing PrEP, we are going to do an HIV risk assessment, a PrEP eligibility. Uh, assessment for people who are HIV negative. And this is something that was uh, covered uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Peralta and Dr. Sweat in the previous days. So basically you're gonna do these questions and I will, I will show them afterwards just for a reminder, but you are gonna assess if a person is eligible for PrEP and you are gonna assess the risk of that person, the risk that that person has to uh, acquire HIV in the near future. So in this link, link uh, in this, Pilar, in this third pillar of the, of the cascade, you are gonna have three different situations. You may have people who are HIV negative and that are not at substantial risk of HIV. Maybe because they, I mean, because based on the practice, you can uh, conclude that they are not at risk of HIV. And then you are gonna have another bunch of people that are all the ones that are in, in purple that are actually of HIV risk. Our experience in other countries is that usually the, the profile of people who are at risk of HIV among key populations ranges from 60 to 80%. So 
So this, uh, this uh, at least the ones who attend to the services. Um, so among the people that you have at HIV risk, you are gonna have some people who are gonna start PrEP. They are gonna have the offer of PrEP and they are gonna start PrEP and other people who won't start PrEP either because they don't want it or maybe because the country has not the capacity to offer PrEP at that moment to that population. But still this needs to be monitored. When you have the follow-up of people, you will keep these disaggregations and you will have the people to be that is follow-up. That's to say the people in these three possible situations who receive another HIV test within the following 12 months. And then you will have your outcome. You will have how many of them are kept HIV free after 12 months. This is all like an imaginary situation, of course. So here, what we are implying is that people who are not at risk should remain HIV free because they are not at risk of HIV. People who are on PrEP and are regularly taking PrEP and are uh, adhering to treatment, they should maintain also HIV free because they are taking PrEP and they are protecting themselves against HIV. But maybe people who are at substantial risk, but who are not taking PrEP may have a higher rate of zero conversion or high risk of, of course, of acquiring HIV. <clears throat> so this cascade, it's, uh, it's, this is a proposal of disaggregation for the prevention cascade that it can be a little tricky at the beginning when you're starting implementation because you may have a low number of people on PrEP. So basically in terms of graphic or graphics, you are not gonna be able maybe to see these bands here because it's gonna be very narrow. You only have maybe hundreds of people in PrEP. So at the beginning of implementation, there are other alternatives for monitoring PrEP services. Uh, and I will show you the, the other cascade that you may build uh, for the beginning of implementation. That is the case in Belize. But before that, I just would like to show you some of the key indicators for PrEP monitoring. Some of them are included in the PrEP cascade. Um, and these are the indicators that are recommended by WHO in the document that is uh, referenced at the bottom of the page. It's a, the manual of uh, the WHO implementation tool for PrEP that was published by WHO. And it has a module of monitoring and evaluation. So here in this manual, there are four indicators proposed that are indicator one, two, uh, four and five, and we are adding these other two indicators, indicator number three and indicator number six. And I'm gonna give a brief uh, overview of these indicators. Indicator one is the percentage of eligible people among the key populations who initiated PrEP at least once in the past 12 months. And it's like a proxy for acceptability. What we are measuring here is the number of people who are on a, on a, on a service who receive the offer of PrEP and accept it, okay? So you are at, you say to the patient, okay, you are at risk for HIV, you would benefit for taking PrEP and that person may accept or not accept. So this is what we measure with the acceptability here. The second one is the percentage of key population who started PrEP and maintain it for three consecutive months. And this is an indicator of adherence. Mm. We measure or we consider the three months and the reason because WHO proposed these three months of to establish adherence is because it, it has been uh, observed how most people who abandon PrEP do it at the beginning of the regime. So they start and they abandon after one, two months. So it is considered that if the person stays with PrEP for three months is more likely to stay on PrEP. So this is why it's used as a proxy of adherence for, for PrEP. Then this third uh, indicator is something that, as I said, we added before because we missed that indicator in the in the form. I mean, by we, I mean PAHO. Uh, and it's the number of people who receive oral PrEP at least once during the past 12 months. This indicator is important because it accounts for people who were actually on PrEP before the year. So, I mean, I may have to start PrEP in 2019 and on PrEP on 2022, and I need to be also counted as a person who's on PrEP. This is, for example, what uh, the GAN report may ask. The, in the GAN report, the, the, one of the indicators of PrEP is the number of people who are on PrEP in the country. So that would be the, the, the indicator to report on the, on the GAN report. <clears throat> then there are two indicators of toxicity, toxicity and failure. One of them is about the number of people who started PrEP and abandoned because an adverse effect. So someone that may have uh, headaches or stomach problems or whatever, and they decide to stop PrEP. And this needs to be also measured. And the other one is on failure. It's so people who are supposed to be on PrEP, but who uh, were HIV positive in one of the follow-ups. 
The most likely reason for that is uh, poor adherence. So this is why these cases, when this happened, they need to be investigated to be sure what happened with that particular case in which someone is, uh, gets HIV when they are uh, supposedly to be on PrEP. And I will give a little bit more of insights of that afterwards. And finally, we propose also to monitor some indicators of STIs among people on PrEP. This is a good question. email. And we have an X-ray department that's sending me. Let us know email. Excuse me, your mic is on. Your mic is on. So as I was saying, this would be important to monitor the STI uh, among people who are on prep. You know that there are like some um, studies that say, oh, the cohorts on prep had a higher rate of STI. That's not exactly true. What happens usually with the cohorts on prep is that you are doing a higher screening on these populations. So you are finding STIs that you wouldn't find otherwise. But it's important to monitor this also as a, as a, as this a good opportunity to have this information. So as I was saying before, this cascade that I showed uh, that includes is the HIV prevention cascade, the standard HIV prevention cascade with PrEP disaggregations may be complicated to do. I recommend it to do it, but it may be complicated to have a very graphic uh, impact on it when you are starting PrEP because you are gonna have a very low number of people on PrEP. So it's not is that you are not gonna see it because the number is very small. So we also propose this cascade to monitor the PrEP services. And this is a cascade that only includes the number of people who are on PrEP. So here we have a first pillar that is basically the number of key population that is eligible for PrEP. So the estimate that may be actually the, the, purple, um, the purple part of this third pillar here. And then, uh, and there is also another way of doing it. Uh, I think that, that, yeah, Belize used last year the PAHO prep planning tool, and there is like a, a way of estimating the number of total need of prep on that tool. So you can also revise that to have, or to calculate this first pillar based on the information that is available on the country. Then you are gonna have the number of people who are evaluated for prep, so the risk assessment. And among those people, you're gonna have the number of people who are on prep. So you can know how many people are actually on prep here. And then when you do the follow-up, that maybe after 12 months, you can have the people who continue on PrEP and here you will have the status of HIV of people on PrEP. This, this purple line is very thick actually, it should be much, 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 much narrower, but it's, I just put it there so you can see it. Um, another way of doing this, and this is the same cascade what I'm gonna show, but just that, that I'm, I'm gonna show you the same cascade, but just for example, you want to do it at a health service level. So if I'm a particular health center that, it, that I'm offering PrEP, I may do this cascade, just eliminating the first pillar. So I will have the number of people that I evaluated for PrEP in my, in my health center, the number of people who are on PrEP, the number of people who continue on PrEP, and the HIV status of these people. So these are like different options for monitoring PrEP uh, or, or for doing PrEP cascades. This one is the ideal one, but when you are starting, you may also want to have this one, or, or you may even want to continue doing this, uh, as, a, doing this as a follow up uh, to follow the cohort that you have on prep. So basically all this information that I was mentioning, all these indicators and all these cascades are built from the bottom. I mean, you need to collect information in the services to be able to build these indicators. So here I'm just giving a quick overview and I'm not gonna go because this is a very, uh, has a lot of text this, this uh, slide, but I'm gonna give you just a brief, a brief idea of what actually we want to, to express here. And then there is a, a like this session because you are gonna be revising the collection forms of Belize. So I think this is kind of, uh, and, and I saw that many of these variables are already included in these collection forms, but Basically, what we have here is uh, two, two main columns. One is the clinical follow-up of people who are on PrEP, and this is the information to be collected. So basically, what we want to say here is that along all the process of follow-up, there is like a minimal information that should be collected from the patients when they visit the, the PrEP facility. Basically, this includes the HIV test results. This includes the, all the metabolic measurements that may be done, like, for example, creatinine measurement and then all the STI and hepatitis testing. So this is gonna allow you to have, uh, uh, or, or this is gonna give you the, 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 the opportunity to build the indicators that I was mentioning before. So this is part of the things that need to be implemented within the health services. Uh, the fact that we need to collect this information. Just a couple of quick consideration I was, um, mentioning before that the cascades are usually disaggregated by key populations. 
um, we um, have a, a, a kind of a, a tool to operationalize key population variables in which we propose, and I think this is par, par, partly already included in the, in the PrEP collections forms from Belize, so we are happy to see that, but basically what we promote is to collect key population variables based on practices rather than in self-identification. And the way, the, the reason because we propose this is because we, we have observed in several countries how you are able to collect higher quality information if you do it this way. So we propose this number of questions that are, uh, I mean, the first is the sex assigned at birth for the person. Then we ask uh, um, which, uh, which were the, the sexual relationships of that person in the last six months, if it were with men, with women, with transgender women, with all of them. So it's a way of, of giving them more, more options so they can we can maybe scratch more information. And especially with MSM, sometimes it's challenging to identify MSM in some context. So we in our experience, this can help to identify more MSM in the services. And then we have questions about the sex work. So if the person has exchanged sex uh, for money and, and also the fact that they are sharing needles or shillings to inject substances. We, we include also the drugs and not, not necessarily the drugs, also the hormones here, because after all the risk factor is sharing syringes or, and needles, right? And then we have a self-consideration variable basically um, meant to, to ensure that we are not uh, losing any information of transgender people. Uh, so this is the, the tool that we propose. It's also in our monitoring framework, and we have good experiences applying this way of categorizing key populations in other, in other countries. So it's, a, it's a, an approach that we recommend that, that, as I said, I saw that it's kind of included already in the data collection forms that Belize is, uh, or that you are going to be discussing late afterwards. Here, just um, for the prevention cascade, and I'm not gonna go deep into this because I'm pretty sure this was covered in the, in the capacity building. This is the risk assessment of PrEP eligibility um, assessment that we um, that is necessary to disaggregate the information of the cascade as I showed before. And all of these are the questions for substantial risk for HIV infection that are based on, on the criteria from WHO. WHO also includes this criteria that is the request of PrEP as a factor for PrEP eligibility. And this is because it is considered that someone who, who goes to a clinic to request PrEP, um, that person may, be, may not want to disclose why she or he is requesting PrEP, but uh, it's very, very likely that that person is under, is on, on, has a high HIV risk and that's why she got or he got informed and went to obtain PrEP or to start PrEP. So we consider that if someone requests PrEP, is a PrEP eligible, is eligible for PrEP automatically. Just, um, um, uh, we are gonna start the wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> of course, monitoring PrEP has certain issues or difficulties because there are like some issues related, especially with the performance and effectiveness of PrEP programs, because it's very complicated to account for both appropriate and inappropriate discontinuation of PrEP. So there is not like a relatively clinical, I mean, for example, and, and I'm gonna put you a counter argument here. If, if I'm on, on, on antiretroviral therapy for HIV, because I'm an HIV person, an HIV positive person, and I stop taking my, my treatment, that's gonna have a clinical outcome, right? If I'm an HIV negative person and I, I stop taking PrEP, that's not necessarily gonna have a clinical outcome. It may have it, I'm gonna be a higher risk of having it, but I may not be able, I mean, I, I may be lucky and I don't get HIV. So measuring performance is complicated, measuring uh, adherence to PrEP. For example, we may have another situation. We may have uh, someone who is uh, an MSM who, who's, taking PrEP on a daily basis, or is prescribed PrEP on a daily basis, but that person is informed and he learns, oh, you know, I may take a PrEP uh, on demand because my risk is only, is very sporadic, so I prefer to take PrEP on demand. And if I record that, that person is actually uh, non-continuous or is not being adherent to PrEP, but the truth is that that person is protected because he's, he's taking PrEP on demand. So he's taking PrEP when he really needs to take it. So. That's just to put a couple of examples of why it's complicated sometimes to monitor the, the adherence to PrEP and therefore the performance of the program. Uh, <clears throat> so due to these patterns, to all these variabilities, it's very important that 
we have a robust uh, unit identification system. So we are able to catch all these patterns of individual risk, uh, adherence, and that we are able to analyze and interpret the patterns of PrEP use in, in our cohorts. And so this is an essential component to, to actually reinforce the PrEP, uh, follow up the PrEP monitoring. But finally, <clears throat> to complete this, um, what, what the monitoring PrEP services is gonna give us is an opportunity, as I said before, to improve our services, to improve th those things that are not working well, or to expand all those things that we are doing well to other services. So for example, we may determine why people who are offered PrEP based on that indicator of acceptability that I showed you before, we may have a low acceptability of PrEP in a certain service. So we may say, okay, why this is happening? So probably we may need to reinforce information campaigns and demand generation <clears throat> to increase this acceptability, right? Also, we need to know why people abandon PrEP. So people may abandon PrEP, yes, because they are having some toxicity, but this is not usually what happens. Usually what people, the reason why people abandon PrEP is because uh, it requires some discipline, right? So you need to go to the service, you need to collect your medication, you need to have follow-up appointments. So this is basically that if you are having a high level of people, a high number of people abandoning PrEP, you may consider review your model of services. You may consider to introduce multi-month dispensing, or you may consider to include PrEP on demand for people who are actually uh, have that risk profile for PrEP on demand, or telemedicine appointment, or for example, HIV self-testing. So everything that reduces a little bit the burden of people having to attend to a service is gonna for sure help to increase the adherence to PrEP. And then you may have also the, the, the monitoring of why people who are on PrEP acquire HIV, and this is kind of related with the second point is usually people who had abandoned or are not being fully adherent to PrEP. So you need also to improve those approaches to increase adherence to PrEP in your community. Now, well, this is basically most of the information that I share with you here is in this document and you have the link down there is the, the framework that I mentioned before, the framework for monitoring HIV STI services for key populations. And it includes all these lists of indicators, all the cascades. You can actually identify how you have to, how you can build each of these um, pillars. And it has been used in several countries to monitor HIV prevention services. We have some success stories of monitoring services in other countries. And it can be a very useful tool definitely for you to, to monitor PrEP services. And I'm gonna go now and I'm gonna do this. Um, well, here we have more further reading and this is also the other documents that were relevant to prepare this presentation and that are good reading if you are planning or on a monitor or you are organizing a monitoring plan for, for PrEP services in the country. Now I'm gonna show you and just uh, a quick over, overview of a spreadsheet that we have developed that helps to calculate most of the indicators that are on this monitoring framework. Um, so let me stop the presentation here. And I'm gonna show you the Excel file. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna be brief about this. Uh, this is a um, um, file that was already shared with Sandra Jones. So I'm pretty sure she will make it available for you. I'm gonna go through a quick overview of what is in this Excel file. As I said before, this is a, a tool I mean, I don't want to call it tool. It's like a spreadsheet we developed with, when we were working with some countries in implementing the measuring of those monitoring indicators that helps to calculate these cascades and indicators based on the data that are available in, in, in the country, okay? So I'm gonna go tab by tab very quickly. Uh, this is the first tab. The first tab is about the list of indicators. Here we have a relation of all the indicators that are included in the PAHO monitoring framework. 
This is an exercise you may do if you want. It's basically marking here which of these indicators are available in the country, which ones may be calculated from the information that is available in the country, and which ones are not available in any, in any, under any circumstance. So you can have like a mapping of what is the possibilities that you have to obtain these indicators, a general mapping. Mm, here you have a tab for data entry in which you introduce the information. Here we have it disaggregated by MSN and transgender women, but we have other versions and we have also the sex workers. So this is basically about introducing the information that you have on the different populations in order to build the, the indicators that you want to build and also the, the prevention cascades that I was showing you before. So you have all this information about key population group sizes, and this is in the information that you can introduce manually. Uh, then you have the prevention cascade indicators. So you have the number of people who are linked to HIV prevention services. And here you have the criteria for linking to HIV prevention services that I mentioned before, the number of HIV negative who are followed up in HIV prevention services, and the number of HIV negative who remain HIV free after 12 months. So these are indicators that, as I said, you introduce manually on these cells here. We have also the HIV prevention care cascade indicators. If you want to build the HIV prevention cascade disaggregated by key population. And then we have some uh, indicators for PrEP disaggregations of the HIV prevention cascade. And this include all the indicators on PrEP that I was showing you on that, um, on that slide that had the HIV prevention cascade with all those purple uh, bands there that were showing the people who had a risk assessment and were on PrEP or not on PrEP. So you can introduce that information here. And in this method and measuring tool um, column, you have basically the explanation of what do you need to introduce. Uh, so here, what you are going to obtain is like a data output. Uh, this is calculated automatically from the data that you introduce here. And it's going to give you all the indicators that you can build, uh, depending on the information that you were able to introduce in the data entry section. So. This is just, a, um, and there are like some data that we introduced by some country here, but basically this is gonna give you the relevant indicators that you may have according to the information that you introduced in the data entry. And then here we have the HIV prevention cascade. This would be calculated basically from the data that you introduced in this, in this first two section, the key population size and the HIV prevention cascade indicators. So you can kind of automatically build your HIV prevention cascade for the population, for the target populations, in this case, the MSM and the, and the transgender women, right? As I said before, we also have this cascade that includes the disaggregations for PrEP. So this comes, as I said, from the data entry from all this uh, section here uh, that is about the PrEP disaggregation for HIV prevention cascade. So you are able to complete this information, you may have this, uh, this uh, HIV prevention cascade bill for the different uh, populations in the country. And finally, we also have like a, what we call PrEP dashboards. And here we may be able to build the, the HIV prevention cascade that uh, is the, sec the second one that I show you that only includes people who are on PrEP. So that allows a higher or a more specific monitoring for people on PrEP. So this is basically the spreadsheet. Um, of course, if you have any, any interest in using it, we are happy to provide <clears throat> like a direct conversation on using this tool or this spreadsheet. Uh, but basically this is about uh, entering the data that you have available in the country and then you will have an automatic calculation of the prevention cascade with a relevant disaggregation and you have them available and if you introduce the PrEP information, you may also have these PrEP cascades that I was showing. So this kind of complements the information that I provided in the, in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. So this is all that I have. And of course, now I'm more than happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. I don't know, Monica, you are there and you also want to add something to what I said. And thank you very much for for giving me this, this space in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nuche. Colleagues at this point, if anyone has any questions. Any questions or additional comments?
I know it's a dense topic sometimes when you present all of this information all together, so I can understand uh, that maybe there are no questions right now, but in, in any moment that there is, I mean, if you have any questions later when you digest all the information, of course, I'm more than happy to reply, to respond to any doubts that you may have. Um, Doc, um, I, um, I appreciated that your presentation acknowledged a lot of my concerns. I also appreciate, uh, so I'm looking at this from a biomedical point of view and an administrative point of view. Based on your presentations, we will have a lot of problems implementing PrEP, but that's the nature of pilot testing, no? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You were addressing me a question, Caleb, or I, I missed something on your statement that I appreciate. Ah, okay, Thank what you. you said because it acknowledged quite a few of my concerns. So it makes no point to ask a question at this time, since the rest is really administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sometimes this most and in our experience, with we have been starting with the with the monitoring, especially of. Uh, of, of HIV prevention services and also with PrEP, the questions arises once the monitoring uh, and the process starts. And it's when you start noticing, oh, how, how should I be counting this? Or how should I, should I be measuring this adherence? Or, and it's when real questions start. And, and, and it's, a, it's a learning process, all, both for the country who's starting the implementation and also for us. Because many of the things that we conclude here are lear lessons learned also, you know, that many of the things that were included in the presentation as, are things that we were learning as we were progressing with this over the over the last few years, uh, we actually have a follow up with some countries planned for these years to to see how they are digesting this information that we presented to some other countries in the Caribbean in the in the previous months, and we have work to do with them uh, to see how they are doing and how are they being able to implement these monitoring aspects. So yeah. And of course, Caleb, we will share these slides, yeah. Thank you. Hi, colleagues. Um, bear with us for a few seconds. Our moderator and chair of the meeting got kicked out of the meeting, so she's trying to, to reconnect. Okay. Okay, so that, that's all for my from my side. I'll stay here, but thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Bernardo, for this uh, great presentation. And um, as colleagues have mentioned, even from day one, we look forward to the, the package of presentations uh, so we can share. Um, obviously, there's uh, several activities, as you will see in my presentation later on shortly, of um, follow-up follow -up discussions and consultation sessions and so forth no? regarding the, the plan for us to, to pilot the, the prep and, and then get the information from there. No? Mm -hmm. Definitely. But thanks very much again, Bernardo. Hi, Enrique. I have a question. Um, firstly, Bernardo, thanks for the presentation. Enrique, I'm, I'm curious about who's going to be doing this monitoring and what role will the civil society play in, in this monitoring? Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thanks for the question, um, Kevin. Obviously, as I mentioned, um, civil society play a key role in terms of the education, the implementation, the recruitment, and so forth. And even in terms of, of the Emani, but there is the Emani subcommittee coming out of the, you can say the, the country team, 
that will be responsible for overseeing and um, Kevin the, the the monitoring of the of the pilot of the prep. No, so we will be using the the committee, uh, which includes um, any officer from the NSC, from the CSO hub, uh, from the PR, you know, from the Ministry of Health, with support from the other country team members. So it's it's in my slide, um, which I will share shortly. But just to answer the question, no, directly. Great, thank you. Can I comment while we're waiting for the mod moderator? Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, she's my friend, Cindy. Oh, well, can I still make a comment because it was related to what was... Um... Sure, Monica, go ahead, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, it's regards to a little bit the role with regards to monitoring and civil society, you know, that this that was just commented and actually um, what was presented is um, in the monitoring of PrEP and the monitoring of the HIV prevention cascades, the basic, these are basic functions of, of the ministry, right? For their accountability of, of what they do and how they're doing it. And, but of course, um, it is very important for the civil society members to understand how this monitoring is done and be able to comprehend the data that is put up, put out, right? So we understand, oh, where does this come from? What is this representing, et cetera, to be able to also contribute to that transparency and uh, accountability function. So um, I think that it's important for civil society to understand what we are uh, talking about when we talk about PrEP cascade, right? And um, and also to be part of this, this dialogue in the monitoring of PrEP. In addition to other basic functions, which could be um, civil society led monitoring, which is, is something else, but just um, with regards to what was posed before, thanks. Yes, Monica, you, you, you make a valid point there. So thanks very much because many instances, you know, um, and it's legitimate concerns, you know, uh, or civil society department would say, oh, we're being used and it's for the numbers and so forth. So the involvement and engagement from the very onset, you know, to, to be aware of, of, of what, these, what this data represents or what these data are, are, will be used for is very important. So thanks for, for the comment. Um, thanks, Monica, for that comment. Because the reason I'm asking is due to like how the CSO hub has developed in Belize is that we have, Kind of building rapport with some of our MSM clients where rather than going to the Ministry of Health to access HIV testing, they have been coming to the CSO hub. The CSO hub has also been offering, for instance, adherence support and even providing uh, follow up with ARVs, picking up ARVs and delivering to clients. So I'm thinking if we already kind of have this rapport with the, the target population that we're reaching, at some point maybe we, we, we're going to be a point of contact for people to pick up PrEP. So it is of, I'm thinking that it's of also of like great value that at some point the CSO hub or CSOs, they kind of have a mechanism where they're able to, to follow up with um, the clients that are picking up PrEP because even when it comes to disclosing sexual orientation or gender identity, we kind of have a way how we, we maneuver that situation. So if, if we want to have like data that's meaningful into the process, it kind of needs to to go in, in in two ways to ensure that we are we are monitoring prep properly so that was that was my trend of thought when i asked who is going to be doing this monitoring and what role the cso's play in this thank you yes definitely if cso's are providing services um then they will be participating in the data collection and in the monitoring process. Um, I kind of just wanted to kind of highlight that this was a function of uh, the governance, right? Process in which um, uh, the government and the program are leading it, but uh, it is 
everybody has to participate. And if, even if they are not participating directly, just by knowing what's going on is very important. But in your case, if the CSOs are, or the CSO hub is providing services that are included in, in what we were uh, representing, then they will also be collecting and monitoring. And there could be uh, further disaggregation um, by the different, as Bernardo mentioned, by the different sites, et cetera, right? So um, all that is part of the monitoring and you're correct, then they would be participating in that, over. Thank you, Dr. Alonso. Any additional questions before we move on? No? systems available for the ongoing monitoring and evaluation of services as well as next steps. Mr. Romero, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cindy. Monica, I see you have your hand raised. Is it a new comment or question? Is it a previous one? Just, just asking. No, sorry, sorry, I'll lower it. Okay, great. Uh, so Cindy, can I share my screen or share my presentation? Can you all see my presentation? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah. all right, oh. thanks. All right. Okay, so good morning colleagues. So um, I will be doing a quick um, presentation providing updates on where we have in the, where we are in terms of the roadmap, the implementation plan updates. So um, here we go. So first, first, I just wanted to, you know, something that um, has been, I, I believe, has been explored from day one in terms of how we should implement PrEP, the key elements of a PrEP service. Obviously, you have the biomedical, the structural, and the behavioral. And obviously, under the bi biomedical, we look at the HIV testing, the PrEP, the NPEP, uh, condoms and lubricants. Under the structural, we look at Dequinalization of transmission uh, and of key populations, um, gender and gender violence approach, laws to protect rights, interventions to reduce stigma and discrimination, uh, behavioral as well, looking at uh, counseling on risk uh, reduction, looking at peer educator, educating programs. And just by looking at this slide, you know, when we look at the, the, the elements to, to consider when implementing PrEP, I just want to share with you that. Um, some of you may be aware that the National AIDS Commission, uh, is, with support from PANCAP and the Human Dignity Trust, we have um, developed and uh, uh, proposed anti-discrimination and equal opportunities bill, sorry, um, as well as a criminal code amendment bill that we plan to table to into parliament pretty soon. And that uh, legislation looks at the protection of 22 uh, characteristics. So we're currently in discussion, um, finalizing um, consultations with um, cabinet members, you know, the government, first of all, to, to get a gauge on, on the political will and, and go from there. So that's that's a huge um, step that we're taking in terms of uh, looking at the, 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 the structural barriers, you know, that, uh, that impede um, or hinder access of services by by key populations particularly. As well, when, when I look at the, the, the um, element of behavior, behavioral interventions, you know, again, exciting because um, under the new, um, or new Global Fund grant, and, and I must take the project again to thank Ms. Carmen Gonzalez, who has been very, very, very helpful in, in providing guidance as our fund portfolio manager. You know, we have, um, we will be getting new uh, peer navigators. I believe we're getting nine peer navigators that will be attached to the Belize Family Life Association, BFLA. We're getting six that will be attached to um, the CSO hub. In addition, we have the adherence counselors in the Ministry of Health, we have the social workers. So we have several layers of support that can assist in terms of the, well, hopefully a successful 
implementation of, of PrEP. No, so I just wanted to, to mention that from the onset. Um, and then to go straight into the um, into the slides, we look at you know the issue of governance leadership. You know, Belize is one of the countries that are is initiating and piloting PrEP under the PANCAP multi-country grant, with obviously technical assistance from PAHU. Uh, and just want to mention again that this is one of the key interventions from our new uh, national strategic plan for HIV, STIs, viral hepatitis, and tuberculosis um, for the period 2021 to 2025. And this is in an effort to achieve the UNA's 90, sorry, 95, 95, 95 goals and NEs by 2030. And I believe I mentioned um, at the beginning of day one for opening remarks that we have a new strategic plan Yes, when you look at it, it's, it may seem very ambitious, but the good thing to it is that there are, we're trying to be um, innovative. There are new initiatives that um, have been proven to, to provide positive results regionally and globally. So we are taking on those new initiatives um, and, and they're being supported obviously by colleagues in civil society, as well as um, the Ministry of Health and Wellness. So the new, like I said, the new Global Fund project for Belize 2022 to 2025 will support the phased, um, phased full implementation of PrEP. And as I mentioned earlier, as again, and was has been previously mentioned, the, the pilot will provide critical information, you know, the monitoring and, and data and so forth to help inform how this um, phasing out will, will take place. Uh, a national team has been established to, to support the rollout of PrEP. And I must say that this national team has been in existence for a while now, for some years now. Uh, it was a team that was spearheading the um, development of the NSP, the, um, the submission, development and submission of the um, Global Fund Grant. Um, so it's the same team, you know, that, that will be overseeing the, um, the implementation of the piloting and subsequent implementation of, of, of PrEP, no? And the team consists of representation from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Sorry, I missed the, the, the word wellness. Um, the Belize Family Life Association. We also have a new principal recipient for the Global Fund Grant, which is the National Health Insurance. So they, they have been involved in, in the discussions. Obviously the National AIDS Commission serving as the country's coordinating mechanism and um, representation from the Civil Society Hub, which again, represents various civil society organizations in the response. No? Let's see. Yeah, we have also, um, we were informed by the, 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 the previous, um, the outgoing um, interim PR, which is UNDP, that the HIV and syphilis uh, dual kits should be arriving, I, I believe it's either today or tomorrow. So, so that is good news. The Ministry of Health and Wellness also informed us that um, Trovada is available for, for the for piloting, which is which is excellent news as well. And I just want to mention also as part of the updates that in April 16th of, of last year, the National East Con Commission coordinated a consultation session with transgender persons in Belize to discuss a package of services, you know, to be included for, for them. Uh, this obviously included PrEP and as well, just want to mention that in this session, um, we had the participation of 10 civil society organizations from Belize, as well as a presentation from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the National Health Commission, and the National Health Insurance. As sorry, not the, yes, and um, UNDP as the um, the outgoing um, principal recipient as well. Also, just to mention that uh, on September 3rd of last year. The NAC again coordinated a work session with MSN and transgender persons in Belize. And the purpose of this um, session, work session, was to review and discuss the package of services to be provided to MSN and trans as per the operational plan, which obviously includes, you know, HIV self-testing, pre-exposure prophylaxis as some of the key um, initiatives. And again, during this consultation session, five CSOs participated. Um, along with the PR, the National Commission, the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And our good friend Caleb it was uh, a participant in both of these sessions, uh, along with other civil society members. No? Again, when you look at the pilot phase, uh, this, the sites that were identified for this pilot phase are the Belize Family Life Association, 
We also looked at Matron Roberts Health Center. And again, uh, CSOs will be supporting uh, the community outreach, promotion of the service, recruitment, referral slash accompaniment, et cetera. And as I mentioned a while ago, uh, under the Global, Global Fund Grant, uh, we are getting nine uh, peer navigators for BFLA, six for the CSO hub, and as part of their terms of reference, uh, definitely pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, is, is, is embedded in the, in the terms of reference. We also, um, well, obviously these three day um, uh, training on PREP and NPEP uh, spearheaded by PAHO with support from PANCAP and the Global Fund is part of, 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 of the plan. So, and again, you know, the objectives of the training, training healthcare providers from the pilot sites and, and other uh, public and private sectors, also to get key populations so we can use this as a, as a way of sensitizing them on PrEP and um, ensuring that we all have our roles to play when it comes to the promotion and supporting the services uh, among the network of key populations. And just to mention a few things that have been done so far, uh, I think it was Bernardo that was spoke about or made reference to the uh, tool. So a casting was done, a prep casting was done for key populations by a, by a consultant, uh, Ms. Faith Cunningham, who is on the call as well on, 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 the, on this meeting. Um, so using the tool, you know, the, um, the casting was done. So that's part of the, of the, the overall planning as well. And again, it's important for us to, um, as part of our resource mobilization plan and advocating for, for more funding from the, from the Ministry of Finance, from, from the Office of the Prime Minister. No? We also, um, as part of the updates, we have also, the Ministry of Health also completed the, the revision of the guidelines for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So the guidelines have been completed. And I must say again that um, we adapted, adopted, adapted uh, guidelines that were prepared by PAHO PANCAP. So we did revision. And so that has been completed as well. We also, um, you know, the Ministry of Health and Wellness also, you know, they have completed the, the follow-up forms. So all these are, are, are available and should be printed pretty soon. Also, um, the forms for um, PrEP screening, as well as the, the notes on procedures when initiating PrEP for the first visit, all these um, forms have been revised and uh, completed by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Um, going into information, communication, and education, I see materials. Uh, the ones you see on the screen are, are, are the mater IEC materials that um, were produced by, by PAO and PANCAP. And these materials have been adapted, uh, adopted and adapted by, by, by us in Belize. And these, the, the messages, you know, and the, and the graphics and everything was was um, developed by PANCAP and based on regional consultations and inputs with key populations. So we have already um, received um, locally three quotations from three um, printing entities, printing agencies, um, that those quotations have already been submitted to PANCAP. So hopefully uh, pretty soon we should be um, getting, you know, printing um, postcards, pamphlets, Posters. We also intend to print the um, testing algorithm, to print the HIV guidelines, uh, the, the screening forms, and, and, and the intake forms. So all of these, um, like I said, have been sent to PANCAP uh, and should be print, printed soon. No? So these messages will be tailored to, to the Belizean context. So the next steps, um, again, uh, the country team has a work session tomorrow uh, to look at global fund issues and other issues. And, and definitely we, one of the items on our agenda is to discuss a proposed um, start for the pilot phase uh, based on the guidelines, you know, the services that will be, that will be included include um, daily prep, event-driven prep, um, as well as testing and treatment for syphilis and hepatitis B and C. Again, um, ongoing monitoring of the pilot phase. This will also include in-country capacity building for the pilot sites by Colin Lord from New York. And again, this will be supported under the regional uh, PANCAP Global Fund grant. Um, again, based on the monitoring and evaluation of the services during the pilot phase, uh, like I said, the information gathered, the data gathered will assist the country team in terms, uh, in particular, the Ministry of Health and Wellness in determining the, 
the rollout of the services to other um, key facilities. Because remember, we're we're starting with Matron Roberts and uh, Belize Family Life Association, who will be working closely with the civil society hub and its members. Um, right. Um, also, um, as was mentioned earlier, the Nationalist Commission will collaborate with PANCAP and PAHO. We want to organize a session with um, for civil society organizations in the region to share their experiences with our civil societies in Belize. You know, um, we had um, Sasad Joel, you know, talk a little bit and, and, and some of the things he mentioned, it, even though it was a brief presentation, are very interesting. So. We want to learn more. We want to need. We need to know more, and so that we can um, ad adapt some of these, or you know, um, modify it so that it can it can work for us. So that's an activity that um, we will be planning very very shortly, um, as well as the. I think somebody had spoken about the focus groups. Um, again, this um, here that you see on the screen is is. Is the um, for the pilot the the purpose of the focus groups? How it will be done? You know, separate consultations, asking a few questions. So again, this this focus group as well is something an activity that we we should be planning very shortly. And obviously, again, um, would be led primarily by our colleagues in the civil society. Um, I think Kevin mentioned some very important points. You know, of of the rapport and the networking, and we want to strengthen that. That is the direction we want to go. To ensure that our key populations, you know, have that that trust uh, with with the um, civil societies, so that there's linkage then to the healthcare facilities when when needed. No, so that is the direction we definitely want to to go. No, um, yeah, and that brings me to the end of my very brief, what I hope informative presentation. So, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. If I, I believe there are other colleagues from the country team on the call as well that can chip in and answer some questions as well. No? So back to you, um, Cindy. Thank you, Mr. Enrique. Um, taking questions at this time. of the last peer navigator interventions. Caleb, if you would like to expound on these questions, please go ahead. I spent a lot of time engaging the system. In German, that's Stanton, by the way. Um, The peer navigators experience navigation um, administrative problems like payments on time. Um, they experience problems with regards to additional issues that are not biomedical in nature. And um, information is collected from them where nothing is learned more, the lessons learned aren't socialized broadly. So the system knows um, the same, has the same level of knowledge when they started versus when the they program is taught. So I was asking if there was an evaluation report around the challenges and the impact of the peer navigator program in past years to then appreciate what are the opportunities for supporting the correct process. That's one. Two, um, I was also asking the question around whether the availability of Truvada would be limited to 50 or 100 people, or it would be adjusted according to the evaluation process. Three, I remain concerned that the, that the, uh, the peer navigation intervention is incomplete. As again, we treat, we're, we're talking about pre prep, but I will repeat this again. We don't live single issues and single identity lives. And as long as the system insists on ignoring that, what you'll have is an inherent problem. And 
uh, couple of the presenters pointed out what the adherence problems are. In any case, I'm happy to see the system trying to experiment um, with the process of PrEP. Um, I will continue to monitor to see if it meaningfully translates the knowledge is required into new interventions. And I close there because everything else is unrestricted. Thanks, thanks very much, Caleb, for, for the comments. And, uh, you know, I, I take the opportunity, Caleb, to, to invite you to engage more with the country team uh, so that we can collectively find ways to improve in, 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 in all the work. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it can no longer be business as usual. You know, um, yes, there are some lessons learned from the peer navigators program that we experimented or piloted with. So all these things, you know, we need to collectively look at how these can be um, improved. No? So like I said, I take the project to invite you uh, as part of the CSO hub or, you know, individually as Unibam to be more engaged with the country team and provide some of the, the recommendations for, for solutions on the way forward. No, but I, I, I do um, respectfully take note of your comments and, and, and your questions, Kaylin. Um, uh, anyway, Ken, you don't have to ask twice. So I've sent some emails and I'll continue to send more. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, noted. Well noted. Some persons on this call who are also taking notes, so duly noted. Do we have any additional questions or comments? Hi, Cindy. Um, I just want to say thank you, Enrica, for this presentation. It really gave me an orientation as to what's the next steps. I pretty much look forward to what's going to be the outcome of Friday when you decide when this pilot is going to be rolled out. Um, one thing that I got to say is that since uh, I posted on social media that PrEP is going to be rolled out, there has been a lot of MSMs that have reached out uh, via Facebook to ask more about where and how they can get PrEP. So this is really good, um, given that there seems to be interest in this program. I, I really feel that as, as civil society, it's important to like jump on this and do some educational information with our community. I'm thinking face, a Facebook Live can be really worked on. So if there's any medical person that has been in this call that would like to participate in that Facebook Live, I think we should coordinate that and, and get the word going because I mean, this is, this is really good. It's something that is I feel meaningfully addressing HIV response, especially taking into consideration who is the most prevalent um, community in, in, in the HIV epidemiology in the country. So that's really something good to look forward to and to start working on. So thank you for, for this. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin, for those positive comments. And again, you know, your, your door is open. You're always welcome for us to, you know, come to the table and look at uh, ways to improve and, and to do things uh, better. I, I can recall, um, I, and Cindy's here, she, she posted it on Facebook a few months ago. She was posting about PrEP and HIV self-testing and so forth, and the media got caught of it. Uh, you know, and uh, I was invited, I was invited to Love FM morning show where I spoke about PrEP. I think I, I, I was part of SunUp, where Kevin is a co-host. Uh, so the word is out there. So we need to do more in terms of, of IEC and, and again, that promotion and so forth. So there's there's tremendous work to be done ahead, no? So thanks for those positive comments. And I look forward to to greater collaboration uh, with with all our partners, no? Yes, come on, sign up again. <laughs> so early. <Yes. laughs> Any additional comments or questions before we close for the day? And it's not for today, actually. This is day three. I think it's been very informative. I think there's, there was a lot of information, but a lot of important information that we all needed as we move toward the piloting of PrEP, you know, and its eventual rollout. So... Well, it's um, our last day, Cindy, so maybe I yes, don't know if we can get Sandra, is, our colleague from PAHO. Yes, for, yes, yes, yes. That, that was just... Some final, final remarks. Mm-hmm.
Um, Dr. Umar, um, sorry, Cindy, Dr. Umar has a question who will be responsible for showing the responses, the comparison. Um, Dr. Umar, Timothy is helping me. Um, Timothy, we are unable to show the responses of yesterday, but we have today's response that maybe Timothy can show. Um, Timothy, are you there? Hi, Dr. Singh. The results should be on screen now. Um, I'm not seeing it. Is anyone else seeing the result? Yes, yes. it's popped up for me. I'm seeing it, okay. yes. Gotcha. Yeah, we're seeing it, Dr. Singh. Okay. Uh, Hortensia, do you want to comment on the results of the questions? So I will need to be leaving. Okay, okay. Okay, this is the the whole pool, no, Dr. Shanti? Shanti, this is the post-test or the pre-test? This is the post. Yeah, I, at this point, we're unable to share the pre with you, Dr. Omar, but this is the post. Okay, in this first question, uh, is the all the following person are eligible to prep exit? This this question has a lot a uh, single choice, uh, but I can't see the whole. Okay, now the this as HIV negative bisexual man who has frequent condom the sex act. act. We, we want to know with this question, who is the person who are eligibly for PrEP except, except, we, we, we look in the except, who in this, in this uh, pool of the person is the except? One person that is HIV negative and is bisexual and has frequent condomless sex as is eligible. Uh, an HIV negative commercial sex worker has had condomless, is also legible. As HIV negative bisexual man who is in a relationship with an HIV positive male partner who does not, uh, I don't know who's, who, who is the, what, is, what the whole uh, question, uh, but, I tried to find uh, in the, my computer. Dr. Shanti, I can see the whole question. Okay. In the, in the first question, we look in the except. And the except is an HIV negative woman in a monogamous relationship with an HIV positive partner who is and on antiretroviral is adherent and has an undetectable viral load. Because remember, if one person is had, has treatment with antiretroviral and this person is undetectable, undetectable is equal to uh, intransmissible. The partner of this person don't need PrEP, is not eligible for, for PrEP. For PrEP. Uh, I lost the, I lost the pool. Dr. Shanti, help me. Um, Timothy, are you there? Can anyone else see the pool? It's, it's still up for me. It's still up for me. For me, it's I'm gone. Gonna... Um, oh. it's, the, uh, it's minimized at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, minimize, okay. Yeah, so you mm -hmm. just need to click where you see the Zoom icon. You just need to, I think you minimized it. So just go to your control bar at okay, the bottom okay. of the screen. Mm -hmm. Right. Look for pool. No, pool. I, am not, I am not capable to see the- There's an icon that's the pools. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I saw, I saw. Sorry, sorry. Then and then the the majority of the person answered the the appropriate uh, answer is the four is a HIV negative woman in a monogamous relationship. This, this is not eligible for prep. 
Um, in the second, the most common side effect among persons using the WHO as CDC recommended per regimen, recommended per regimen are, and we need to mark one and the, the majority respond rash, drowsiness, and headache. The, the, the correct response is nausea and headaches and flatland. This is the most uh, frequently um, adverse effect. In the third one, all the following are contraindication of PrEP, except we are looking the except, remember. Pregnancy and breastfeeding, breastfeeding is, is, the, uh, is a contraindication for PrEP. This is except. The, it's, an, it's a not contraindication for PrEP, correct? Because all the, the other and be HIV positive or has an impaired renal function or had signs or symptoms of, of acute HIV infections are a contraindication of, um, of PrEP. Uh, my concern is this 33% of people respond that accept the first one. We need, maybe is the, the way of the question was constructed, but in this question, we need to know we are looking the except. One person that's HIV positive is not eligible for PrEP. One person is HIV positive needs antiretroviral treatment, linkage to the care, to the continuum of care, uh, received triplet therapy antiretroviral. The fourth question said, before an individual can initiate or continue PrEP, she or he must have a recently documented HIV test that is negative. In, in this question is correct. 100% of the people respond uh, correctly, no? And maybe in the, in the previous uh, question is was the way that was constructed. I, I want to believe that. In the fifth, fifth question, the fifth question, once initiate PrEP cannot be discontinued. 22% uh, respond true and 78% respond false. We need to remember PrEP is not a treatment. PrEP is not antiretroviral treatment. PrEP is an intervention for uh, the decreased risk in the person who has high risk of acquisition of HIV. It's a person who has, for, at the moment is not sick. And also the risk can be different uh, or seasonal risk, seasonal risk. And in this case, we need to know the, the, the is false. PrEP can be discontinued when, when the person wants to, to stop PrEP or the situation change. The majority respond, okay, but we have 22% of the people to need to, to clarify, clarify, clarify this. The sex, this trans woman and hormonal therapy should not prevent them from initiate PrEP, provided that they, there are not existing contraindications. This is, oh, okay, a trans woman can receive PrEP. The only recommendation is uh, we don't have enough evidence to recommend them on demand PrEP. A transgender woman, when we receive hormones, they need to receive um, a daily prep, no? And this is the majority response, okay, by 22% uh, 
of the response is wrong. <clears throat> okay, how frequently should one conduct HIV testing and ask questions about symptoms and acute HIV infections? Uh, the appropriate answer is at least every three months. Okay, we need to emphasize this. How frequent, and the eighth question, how frequent should, should one evaluate renal functions? We know in the um, OMAR talk uh, 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 about this and the guideline of the, the WHO recommendation said at least every six months, yeah? But in the moment, we are in the um, updated of this and maybe uh, in the in a few months this recommendation changed but at the moment it's at least every six months uh, and the nine question said which of these statements are correct in relation in relation to the model of comprehensive care in key population this is a selection uh, multiple choice and in this in this question, you can answer three. The appropriate three are, it is important to take a complete medical history that includes sexual history. Also, a rapport should be achieved before asking a specific question about sexual practice. And also PrEP service are an opportunity to screen for STIs and aspects of sexual and reproductive health that, uh, these are the three. Uh, is is a little concern. Twenty two percent of the people still believe the conception and value judgment of the health worker is the main thing to be able to convince people. Because we talk uh, a lot about our judgment, our values are not um, the the main thing in our clinical evaluations. In the 10 question, in relation to HIV testing answer, we are looking the incorrect, incorrect. Uh, we, we need to, I, I, I try to understand when we ask in one question, the incorrect, we need, to we need to read very careful because HIV cell testing provide a definite diagnosis of HIV infection. This is, that is our, that are incorrect. And this is the majority, but the other are correct because it is possible to use contact network for the creation of demand for HIV and STI testing. Also HIV cell testing can be performed by the individual at home and this increased privacy and confidentiality. Also is correct, it is possible to use a dual HIV syphilis testing to maximize diagnosis opportunities. And also HIV rapid tests can be offered and performed in community setting by training lay provider. The, the, the first one is the incorrect because we need to remember HIV self-testing is a, a screening. And if one person is positive, it's necessary to, to follow the national algorithm for confirm the HIV infection. If you have um, any question or need clarification about this, I try to turn on my camera, but not. Hello? Oh. Somebody, someone needs clarification about the, the questions? It's, it's, for me, it's very important two points. Everyone to, and to, to be included in a PrEP program need to be HIV negative. This is absolutely correct. HIV self-testing is a screening, we can use uh, and the network contact and the network of the patient to, to reach more people on risk and 
also find people can be can have HIV uh, or people can have high risk of acquisition of HIV. Um, we can use PrEP uh, and people who has high risk, like uh, Bernardo explained, magnificent today. And these people can um, use PrEP for seasonal uh, risk. Maybe I had sex only two times of the month, or maybe I have sex every day. The people are different and the situation are different. This is a challenge for the program and for the monitoring, but PrEP is effective in the modality of dial PrEP, daily PrEP, and also on-demand PrEP uh, depend of the, of the people, no? of the clinical, uh, evaluation of the people. And we need to take from this training, PrEP service is an opportunity to, uh, uh, to reach people we cannot reach with other interventions. We can integrate the diagnosis of STIs, hepatitis. Uh, we can offer counseling, we can offer uh, integral education for the young people. This is an opportunity, a big opportunity to change the, the national response and reach the people. And finally, decrease the new infection of HIV. Also provide a comprehensive care model for the people. Mm, I don't know if you have questions. Any additional questions where was everything clear? Anyone? Comments? Uh, Cindy, <laughs> I, I want to say something. Uh, sure. If this uh, PrEP service, or even though the national response to HIV is not, can be done just from the Ministry of Health. That how we said in the, in the slide or in the presentation, we need to participate together with the communities, with the civil society, uh, civil society, uh, it's, it's very important to address in the structural barriers like a stigma and discrimination, and also to, to reach the people, the, the, the experience of the peers, training peers uh, about the efficacy and also the, uh, the useful of this intervention are very important. Just for, uh, for, for the closeness. Indeed, indeed. Like everything else, it will take community effort. All right, if there are no other questions and everything is clear, 100% clear, <laughs> then we could go ahead and proceed with closing. Um, I'm going to call on, at this point, any of my colleagues, either from PANCA, PAHO, or the National AIDS Commission to provide any final remarks before we end. Hi, Cindy. Um, I will just very just briefly on behalf of um, PAHO, the PAHO representative in Belize, Dr. Noreen Jack. I would, I just want to say that um, to, thank, to thank all the participants for participating in the three days training. I think um, the, the participation seems to have been very um, um, good with the number of persons who have um, participated. And also to thank my other colleagues from um, the PAHO headquarters for their commitment um, 
to the process and for facilitating the sessions over the last three days. And also to, um, to reinforce that PAHO is committed to the process and through the country office, we will continue to provide the technical support and the guidance to the country for the pilot phase and hopefully eventually the um, rollout based on the monitoring and evaluation that um, started. So thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for uh, participating. And we look, and also I must say thanks to PANCAP for the ongoing uh, collaboration. And we do look forward to um, the next phase, which will come out of this um, workshop and for the possible um, outcomes. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Sandra, and I know that Dr. Tran has her hands raised. I, I believe she's she wants to ask a question relating to what she put in the chat. Um, how are they going to be able to obtain the recordings and the PPTs? I don't think that should be a problem. Um, Ms. Jones, would participants have access to the recordings? And the presentation. Right, so um, the, I, I hope you were recording for today. Yes, I see it is recorded. Um, the recordings will be shared as well as the presentations, exactly. And they will be shared, I think from PANCAP um, through the National Aid Commission and Ministry of Health. Yes, thanks. Perfect, and yes, we could definitely facilitate. Ms. Enrique, go Yes, I send the thanks uh, again, uh, colleagues, on behalf of the chair of the National East Commission, Dr. Giovanni Solorsano, the entire National East Commission members, uh, our very esteemed partners and colleagues at the civil society. I want to thank uh, all those persons and agencies that made this possible. I think it was a, an excellent uh, three-day uh, training. I personally enjoyed the training. Um, so I want to thank personally um, Sandra from from Powell's original office and her colleagues uh, that presented during these three days from uh, headquarters. I also want to thank uh, PANCAP, Dr. Shanti Singh, Timothy, who is controlling the, the poll. And like I said, everybody, all our partners who made this, um, this uh, three days training a very successful one. So thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, further collaboration and uh, ensuring that you know, we, we do things the proper way you know, with proper guidance as well. So thank you very much all. Thanks, Cindy, as well. Great job. Thank you. And on that note, we end our final training day. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And we look forward to your continued collaboration. Bye.